Welcome to the Leonard Peikoff Show. A well-known teacher and author, Dr. Leonard Peikoff is Ayn Rand's chosen heir and the leading authority on her philosophy of objectivism, the philosophy she presented in her famous novels The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged. And now, here's Leonard Peikoff. Today, an interview with Mary Ann Suries, a distinguished art historian. We're going to talk with her about art. What is art? What is its role in human life? What is good art? Is modern art art? Can you judge art objectively, or is it merely a matter of taste? So we have a full plate. So I'm going to jump in with some brief biographical remarks about Mary Ann Suries. She did her graduate work in art history at Wayne University in Detroit and New York University's prestigious Institute of Fine Arts. She's taught art history at New York University and Hunter College. She's lectured on the aesthetics of the visual arts in a lot of places, New York, Philadelphia, Washington, and tape recordings of her lectures have been played in many cities in the uh, United States and Canada. Uh, Mrs. Suri specializes in analyzing paintings and sculpture to show how they convey an artist's view of man and also in analyzing the nature of people's response to art. Her own particular field of specialization is Greek, Roman, and Italian Renaissance art. At present, she's writing a book on the relationship between art and reason. Ms. Suri's is now a docent at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., now, yesterday, we had a generalized discussion of art on the show, and I elicited from you, or from the callers, various tantalizing leads as to what art is. We got this much out in one form or another, that art is an end in itself. It has to be understandable. In some way, it's an important or intense emotional experience. Uh, the artist is selective. He doesn't just uh, show us, quote, reality as it is. Somehow, as one of the callers put it, he makes reality more interesting. A really pregnant and fascinating observation we want to follow up today. Um, some of the callers pointed out that art gives them some kind of a message, like one person said, I think, and a piece of music told him, the battle of life can be won. And somebody else told him about a painting it made him feel alienated from the world. And somebody else told me that a piece of art gave him the message, the ideal is inspiring, but it's unattainable. So some kind of way we get a message. And as the callers pointed out, you can tell something about a person by their responses to art, an artwork. The whole thing is somehow very important to our life, but why? What is this thing that elicits this strong experience that does something to reality that gives us some kind of message or inspiration or, or put down? And what does it tell us about a person? These are the kind of questions we're going to talk to with Mary Ann Suries, art historian. And I will have calls as soon as I finish my preliminary list of questions to her, which hopefully will be by 3 o'clock. Mary Ann, are you on the line? Hello, I'm here. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Oh, I can hear you perfectly. It doesn't seem like you're all the way on the East Coast. Let me welcome you to the show, and thank you for taking the time to talk to us about art. Uh, can we plunge in? And uh, we're not asking you right off the bat, but soon, but not right off to give us a definition of art. But in some generalized way, let's agree that we're going to talk about paintings and sculpture, which is primarily, which is your field. And occasionally I'll throw in something on literature, which is a little bit my field. And we won't say very much, if anything, about music or architecture, because music is almost impossible to talk about, because there's no vocabulary worked out for it. And architecture introduces so many complexities because you actually live in it uh, rather than just contemplate it. So we'll kind of assume that what we're saying could be extended to music and architecture, but we'll focus on paintings and sculpture with some literature occasionally. What... Uh, assuming that that's what we mean by art, can you give us some kind of description of what these things have in common that justify us in putting them all together? Well, do you want me to start with the definition? Well, do you think you can just give it to us cold? Will anybody understand it? Well, let me give the definition. Okay. Now, this and is, then this is your, def your definition? Or no, who? this is the definition of Ayn Rand. Okay. She is the only philosopher who's ever defined art. 
All right. So let me start with her definition and break it down, and you can jump in any time if you want to amend or add something. Well, can you give it slow and twice? Right. Because definitions are poison to a radio audience. As soon as they hear the word, even the D-E-F, they start changing the dial. So you have to slip it over on them. Well, let me first read the definition and then break it down word for word. That is the essential words in it. Okay. As defined by Ayn Rand, art is a selective recreation of reality according to the artist's metaphysical value judgments. All right, now let's get whoever wants to get that down. Now, we can say at the outset that nothing will ever be as hard again this, this, core, this show, right? Selective recreation of reality according to the artists. Can we change basic from metaphysical to basic just in order to make it a little simpler to understand? If according, you like. according to the artist's basic value judgments. In other words, when she says metaphysical value judgments, she just means the ones that really are at the root of his whole view of things, not just his value judgments as to what toothpaste he likes or what brand of soap or what brand of soup. Right. So, so we, we'll get rid of the word metaphysical because that's pretty heavy. So it's a selective recreation of reality according to the artist's basic value judgment. Now let me play, you know, the regular, ordinary, intelligent person who has no idea what art is here. What do you mean by such an incredible mouthful? Selective recreation? What do you, plunge in and give us something of what does this mean? Well, let's start with the word re recreation. Okay. What does it mean to recreate something? It simply means to create something anew. Right. To bring into existence and life something that hadn't existed before. Okay. So the artist is recreating reality. Right. He's creating a whole reality? No, no. He is selectively recreating it. He's not creating an entire reality. Reality is everything in the world around us. Everything which exists. Right. What the artist does, he selects from all the possibilities in existence. He chooses some things over others. He prefers some things over others to put in his artwork. Mm -hmm. Now, selectivity is the real essence here in the definition. Could you so, give us an example if you were doing a painting or if an artist was doing a painting? Is selectivity just that he decides to place, paint something red instead of green or big instead of small? Is that what you mean? That's part of it. That is part of it. Selectivity pertains to every aspect of the work, from the choice of his subject to the smallest detail of the subject to the choice of the colors, the lights, the shadows, the placement of everything. By the choice of subject, you mean like whether he shows a hero or an old hag picking her nose or whether right. he... Whether he shows a landscape, a still life. All of that is part of selection. What he does, how he does it in every detail. Right. Well, I still don't know, what does this have to do with recreating reality? I can see that he's recreating, say, a sea if he does the sea, or he's recreating a man if he does the man, but what has this got to do with reality? Because a sea and a man is part of reality, yeah. part of that which exists. Yeah. Now, when you have a selection yeah. of anything... A standard is required. Or well, how else is the artist going to decide which things to choose and emphasize and which things to eliminate? Yes. He has to know what the alternatives are, how to choose things, what is going to guide his selection from the subject to all the details in the painting, from what he represents to how he represents. To what guides it? What guides it? Yeah. There we come to his basic value judgments. Do you want to illustrate or give us an okay. idea? Well, first of all, when we talk about basic value judgments, fundamental ones, we're talking those judgments which underlie all of his other judgments. And they boil down to essentially his view of the world, of himself, of man, of the possibilities in life. Well, give us... Give us two or three contrasting value judgments of very okay. different so we get an idea what is okay. the right. Well, let me uh, do it by combining it with some artworks. Okay. Um, for example, a basic question in life about man could be this. 
Does man have the power of choice? Can he choose values? Can he choose goals? Can he achieve them? This is a basic issue for a man. You mean some people would say yes to that and some would say no? Right. Now, supposing you're an artist and you say yes, man does have the power of choice. He is a self-competent, self-assured being. He can go after what he wants and he can get it. If you give that answer as an artist, then you're going to make something like Michelangelo's David. It shows a self-assured being ready for action. But supposing you say, no, that's not the essence of man. Man can't really achieve anything in life. He can't find happiness. All he can do is surrender to defeat and live in, let's say, lonely despair. Now, that's another judgment of man as helpless. Mm -hmm. And if that's your view of man as an artist, then you're going to do something like the sculptor Wilhelm Lembrook. I, I've never seen him, so describe well, there, one. I'll describe one. A man on all fours, hands and knees, with his head between his legs. Uh, now, you see the two... He's cowering, he's hiding, is that the idea? Yes, hiding, he's given up. Is a two completely different estimates of man, two different basic value judgments about man. So they're like recreating man in this case, but according to their basic view of what is really important about him, what's really the truth about him. Exactly. Now let's stress the word selective here. When, when Michelangelo created the David, surely he knew that there are human beings who are defeated, who lose the battle, who get killed in war, and yet what was his attitude to that information when he created the David? That it wasn't relevant or important to his purpose, to his view of man at that stage of his life. In other words, he knows that there's other data, but he says, in effect, that isn't the real truth, that's a distortion, that's an accident, that's superficial. Right, right. right. And conversely, what was this guy's name again, this other Wilhelm one? Wilhelm Lembrook. Lembrook. Presumably, he knows that there are people who get elected president and who make a fortune and who are absolutely happy, assuming they are. Uh, but when he does this guy on all fours, uh, what does he say to himself if somebody says to him, well, this is not the truth about man, and what about all the successes? What would he say? He would say, that's not really man. That could happen, but that's not the essence of things. So what the artist tries to do is get past the superficial world where we see everything all mixed up. Sometimes people succeed and sometimes they fail and you can't tell what's an accident, what's the nature of man. And he strips away everything confusing and according to his viewpoint, he gives you reality exactly as he thinks it really is all the way down. Right, right. And that's what you mean by a selective recreation of reality according to an artist's basic value. Does not I'd like you to take, just we have one minute before the first commercial, since you use the word reality rather than man, could you take a seascape or a cityscape or something that's na not a cityscape but like a landscape, something that's nature rather than man, and show how, according to two different sets of value judgments, you might render it two different ways? Well, let me uh, do it uh, in the form of first of a painting. Do you want me to start now before the break? Yeah, mm -hmm. could you just give us once more the definition of art that we're working with? Yes, art is a selective recreation of reality according to the artist's basic value judgments. So the artist takes something in reality, makes a selection, you were saying, to stress certain features, to present it the way he thinks it really is, and according to what he thinks is really counts, is really important, and then the result is, uh, is a work of art. And we showed how this applied to sculpture, and you were going to show us how it applied, I believe, to landscape in the field of painting. Yes, well, I selected is a, a painting called the Portuguese Jewish Cemetery. Wow. Uh, who did that? Uh, by Jacob Juan Rysdale, who was a 17th century Dutch painter. Never heard of him. Okay. Well, let me describe it to you, uh, and then I analyze it. The subject is a cemetery in ruins. And the question is, given this subject, what is the artist saying about man in life? When you look at the painting, there are four focal points. A cloudy sky, ruins of a building in the center, a dying tree,